Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm on the phone right now with Eric Alpenfels. E Eric, tell people a little bit about what you do professionally and then also a little bit about like how you, uh, these studies that you've been doing. Oh, sure. Well, I am the director of instruction and the director of the golf academy here at Pinehurst Resort, North Carolina. And uh, so my, my job kind of entails uh, a little bit of administration work when it comes to the details of the golf academy, but primarily I, I teach. Uh, so 85 to 87 percent of my time is, is in teaching out with the golf schools or individual lessons, and then the rest of the time would be administration of just the business side of the golf academy. So that's pretty much that's pretty much my day. Eric, I, I think I think the first time I saw your name was you had done a study where uh, you were having golfers look at the hole when they did, when they put it. And, um, hold on just a second. Yeah, you, you were having golfers look at the hole when they, uh, when they did putting. What did you find? What was that study and what did you find? Sure, yeah, it was, uh, it was very interesting. The, the study was uh, suggested to us by the editor of Golf Magazine, a guy named Lauren Anderson. And he had seen some folks putting while they're looking at the hole and was just curious to see what would happen. And so he asked us to take a look at it, and we had a large sample of golfers uh, practice uh, in two different formats. One, one group practiced their distance control looking at the hole uh, with preset distances, so everything was pretty neutralized between the two groups. Uh, the other group uh, actually putted the more traditional way, where they would uh, look at the golf ball, whether it's the back of the ball, the front of the ball, whatever they would normally do, and they worked on their distance control as well. And we ran them through what we, I guess as instructors, we would call uh, like the ladder drill in putting, where you had different distances. Now, in our case, to, to balance it out, we, we actually randomized it to where the, a certain group might start with the second distance putt and then go to the last putt and kind of bounce around back and back and forth. Uh, but at the end of the study, we found that the group putted more accurately in the post-test that had looked at the hole, meaning their distance control was greater um, than the, the other group. And it was really, it was actually very su surprising to me. Uh, in fact, uh, when we were looking at the data and we how we input the data, I, I kind of made them, I, I just assumed I might have made a mistake in how I inputted the data and the analysis process part of it, because I thought, how could you ever have that much difference in the uh, results? So we went back and just made sure everything was inputted correctly, and there you have it. We, we, we saw a very interesting trend that with amateur golfers, if they were to practice looking at the hole while they work on their distance control, they actually get a lot more out of the time spent doing that than looking at the golf ball. So, so was that a type of thing where it improves your lag putting in practice, but then... Like, did you have a lot of golfers then actually switch to that on the course, or was that more just for a practice thing? That was more for a practice thing, yeah. Now, uh, we did, we pre-tested them, of course, and then post-tested them after the practice session. And it was, to us, it was pretty powerful that they could make that much of an improvement in a set amount of practice strokes that would be that much different than the, the more traditional way of working on your distance control looking at the golf ball. So, it was, uh, it was pretty interesting finding in that, in that regard. I mean, if you were to say to yourself, okay, I'm going to make 54 putts, I'm going to go work on my distance control for 54 putts, and I know that I'll improve my distance control X amount in that time period, uh, it, it's pretty powerful when it's such a different way to do it. You know, you know normally people don't look at the whole. Uh, of the groups or of the folks that actually practice that way, I'd have to go back and look at them. I'm sure some have switched to it where they're doing that out in the golf course. Uh, but I think the majority of them still utilize it as a way of just practicing their distance control. And then when they get out of the golf course, they'll, they'll still go back to the, the normal way of looking at the uh, golf ball. Uh, just to guess, like, why do you think that that works? Well, you know, it was, it was funny. We, we, at, once, this, once we saw the findings and we started asking around with some people that uh, study eye movement patterns of athletes and things like that, uh, they were not surprised at all. Uh, and, and then I, I had a couple people you know, basically say to me, 
well, if you're shooting a basketball from the free throw line, you're probably not bouncing the ball, looking at the ball, and looking at the ball as it's in your hand as you're ready to shoot. You'd be looking at the target you want to go to. And so it, it, it kind of in the end made sense that we tend to get ball bound, and yet there's not a whole lot of sports that you do where you're not looking at the receiver that you're trying to throw the ball to. You're not looking at the basketball goal. Um, so it, it, maybe it's just it's simpler than we make it sometimes. Maybe it's just it helps you get a visual sense of how hard to hit it. You mentioned hand, like at the handicap range. Is th- is this uh, practicing looking at the hole? Is this uh, beneficial like throughout all the handicaps, or or just, is it something that like is split up? No, I think it was pretty even split uh, across the board. Uh, you know, I think that in, now in, in post, you know, now after we did that study, and I've had a chance to do do it with. Uh, some of the beginners that we get in our golf school and even the advanced players that we get in our golf school, uh, I think it's probably a little bit more challenging for the newer golfer just because their sense of movement and all is a little bit, uh, it's just, you know, it's hard. It's hard to hit it real solid when you're not too sure where the ball is because you haven't really put it all that many times, things like that. Right. Uh, but certainly if they have a little bit of uh, background and, and they have a little bit of experience, it doesn't seem to harm them at all. In fact, in hindsight, looking back, do the study once we were done with it, trying to figure out, you know, what what we what we what did we learn? Uh, I think amongst the people that participated in it, that were like myself, taking the measurements and uh, recording the data, we we actually, in hindsight, felt like well, maybe we even saw people moving their body less if they had a little bit of body motion in the putting stroke. If they're looking at the hole, they're less inclined to move because you don't want to not hit it solid. So maybe we somehow, in a way, manipulated their body motion through the punch stroke. And that's all anecdotal, but that's just what we, we've talked about over the, the years since we've done that study. That's really cool. Okay, so so the uh, the thing that made me want to, uh, to call you was that I saw, uh, I think it was in, a, like in an infographic, so I didn't see the full article, but I saw an, an infographic about... Um, this study that you recently did about whether somebody's last look, or I might have it the wrong way, but it should, should be the target, the ball, and then hit it, or just look at the intermediate target. So kind of go over what this study was and kind of, I think I'm saying it the wrong way, but oh, no. yeah. No problem. No, I, yeah, we, we just, we finished up a study. It's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's probably been a, a few months ago since we actually finished it up, but uh, it was recently picked up by the golf magazine team, and, and they they put it out there. Uh, but the idea is that we wanted to see if there was a benefit of utilizing an intermediate target, or was there, depending on the golfer, maybe they did they would do better if they just aimed at a target at the distance. So we had two strategies that we wanted to look at: the use of an intermediate target, and then also not using an intermediate target and just aiming the club face at the distal target, whether it's uh, you know the, the middle of the fairway, 300 yards away, or whatever it might be. And at the same time, we wanted to experiment with the idea of using an intermediate target, but not letting the golfer look up at the distal target as they normally would. So for example, I'll, I'll just make up a, a routine that we see all a fair amount of times. Yeah. You know, the golfer might use an intermediate target. They'll aim the face at the intermediate target that's two feet away, three feet away, five feet away, whatever it is. And then they'll glance up at the distal target. So they might be glancing up at this point at the green in the distance where they want the ball to land, or they might be looking at the middle of the fairway, 250 yards down, whatever it might be. But they incorporate an intermediate target and the distal target. And so we wanted to see if that was a beneficial strategy and compare that to the strategy of not using intermediate target and just aiming up at the target in the distance. But the third routine of that was where we would have them utilize the intermediate target and, and not look up. So they would hit shots. Once they got set up to the intermediate target and were comfortable, they would just pull the trigger and hit it. And basically we just we measured the outcome, where the ball ended up uh, from, from the center of the fairway, the target, target the green, whatever it might be. So dispersion patterns. Okay. And what's interesting is that we 
didn't really see a, a significant difference between using an intermediate target and looking up or using the distance target and not worrying about intermediate target. There really wasn't all that much difference between the outcomes, which was surprising to me because I, I think as, as an instructor, you're trying to give your students strategies that will help them aim up more correctly and things like that. And I, I certainly still feel like an intermediate target uh, is helpful to aiming, but if it didn't really change the outcome all that much, maybe it's not as, maybe it's more based on the individual. Maybe, maybe people that don't like to use an intermediate target, maybe there's a reason behind it because they don't see a difference in the outcome, or maybe they just prefer to aim at the target in the distance. And again, what we found is that there was nothing, not that much significance between the, the two outcomes. But the third routine of using an intermediate target and not looking up was very interesting because we found that overall the golfer's dispersion pattern was tighter to the target and the distance was greater. And so that was kind of surprising is that not looking up somehow helped them in the performance of the shot and the and the outcomes improved. Now about the only thing you can at you know, at this point we could say is that we just in follow up questions, uh, very often they because they weren't worried about where the golf ball was going, they just tried to put their attention to getting the golf ball to start out over the intermediate target. And so maybe that somehow played into it uh, and the, why the, the outcome was better. Uh, we also had, uh, when we were videotaping them doing these routines, the routines seemed to be a little bit less time. They didn't stand over the ball quite so long when they didn't, when they didn't look up. So maybe that played a part to it. So we're, we're not too sure at this stage what would be the reasoning behind it, but certainly the outcome changed. So my first question is, when when they were doing this like th third way of only looking at the intermediate target, what was the yeah. what was the routine um, with the golfers there as far as like could they stand behind the ball, pick out the intermediate target, and then walk up to the ball and, and then never look at the target again, or how was the routine? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. The only the only piece to the puzzle we took out was that they once they set up to the intermediate target, we just. We just asked them not to look up from that point on. Okay. So what, what was the, your feedback from the golfers? Did that feel really weird to a lot of people? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Just because it's so different. Yeah. Uh, now, having said that, quite a few of them, because they had an opportunity to compare the outcomes, you know, they're, while well, they're participating in something like this, they're certainly monitoring, you know, the, the difference. Um, and at the end of the study, of their participation, I would sit with them and they would fill out a, a post questionnaire. And we, then we had it once, once all the paperwork was done and the study was completed for, for their time with it, uh, we would sit and look at the TrackMan data and kind of figure out maybe there was a pattern to it. And quite often they were saying things like, well, that was kind of awkward, but boy, it really did seem like I did better. Yeah. And it was just, it was kind of interesting because they were, you know, of course we're all, outcome related, we're all hitting shots wondering if it's going to get better one way or the other. So uh, uh, quite a few of them have, have stayed with the idea of using the intermediate target and not looking up and have went out and practiced and played that way and, and we're, we're still getting feedback from them on if, if they like it or not. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not one of those things that's, that's a, a mandatory thing that they have to do. It's just it's one of those things that maybe you'll find that you do, you, you perform better out of the golf course by not looking up. Right. Uh, I know a couple of people, even though they thought it was pretty funny too, because they would see the results on TrackMan that the ball's going a little bit straighter, it's going further, and yet they would say, I just, I don't know if I can do that out of the golf course, which is always funny to me that they would, you know, again, it's, it's out, it's, at least as far as I'm concerned, it's about performance, and if one way helps your performance, why not give it a run? But, you know, it was just, it was so awkward to them and out of their comfort zone that they would, they would say, yeah, I might, I might do better with it, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> right. So what was, what was, like, was it a, between, you said that the, the first two ways were about the same as far as intermediate target or uh, going, going uh, as far as looking at the distal target or flip-flopping between the inter, intermediate target and the distal target. 
they were about the same. Was it st uh, statistically significant, or what was the the from the global view? How much better was it just to only look at the intermediate target? Well, and, and the just by looking at the intermediate target, we found that the, uh, the 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 distance was greater, and the dispersion pattern was tighter to the target. Yeah. And now that would that would vary depending on the individual because people hit the ball different distances and things like that. But um, so just again, kind of interestingly enough, the, the utilizing the intermediate target and not looking up for the group, the groups uh, was more effective uh, in the end, and the outcome was better. Uh, now again, I think that that just lends itself to maybe there are some things that again I'm thinking of it from the instructor standpoint. You know, maybe now when I'm working with a student, I'll give consideration to the possibility of that might be a, a strategy that they could take uh, that helps them out on the golf course. And other times, you know, to, to, again, it's based on the individual, they might not, they might not like, like it and, and they, they would prefer to look up. But again, it's just, it opens up a, maybe a different strategy to improve the performance out on the golf course when it boils down to it. Yeah, what a, an, another reason I wanted to talk to you was in the infographic that I saw, so I don't think it was the full the full deal, it was just like the, the it was like a Instagram infographic about about looking at the intermediate target. And in the thing that I saw, uh, one kind of issue that I had was that it, it showed like the results as far as it's better to look at the intermediate target, and then it said, why? And then it said, the reason is because you're not worried about the the lake in the distance or the trees in the distance and you're only focusing on on get the start line but uh you didn't test that part though right so you, you can't say for sure what the reason would be it, you have just the data of this you know do you understand what i'm saying yeah yeah we, we measured the outcome but we also had a follow-up questionnaire and, uh -huh. and we asked them their feedback on what changed between the, the three different strategies so some of that, some of that response by Golf Magazine would be just taking the, the summary of, of what people said and what they felt. I gotcha. And just trying to put it into context. But again, it's, it's still it, it's it's, an, it's based on the individual. There's a, there's a lot. I mean, basically, uh, in, in in our minds, a good study leads to three more studies on the same topic and variations of it. So right. Uh, we we were excited that it kind of it really opened up a lot of questions. But yes, you're right. I mean, it, who knows? I mean, again, it could be they stood over the ball a little bit less time. Maybe somehow by just thinking about getting the ball to start out over the intermediate target, that was helpful. Uh, you know, I, now again, we're we're on a driving range, so it's not like there's a bunch of hazards out there. Right. But at the same time, maybe it could be beneficial to some golfers that get anxious over the golf ball and and are prone to be looking up at the target and but at the same time they're looking at the bunker on the left and the water hazard on the right and they get preoccupied by that and so yeah a lot of and that's and that's, that's again as an instructor i think that's where i'm encouraging teachers to you know, experiment with it and see if it's beneficial to some of your students okay you you said that that uh you were doing some additional studies uh what what are those yeah, we're, well, we're just always looking at things that will improve the performance of our students. You know, kind of our, our strategy with any research we do here is that it's something that can improve our the performance of our students and, and the skill of our instructors. And then if it can be permeated out to the golf industry, that's fine. And so we're looking at some different things on uh, uh, pre-shot routines, so looking at aiming, um, looking at some putting practice routines and putting. So we always have a couple that we're, we're always looking at and trying to figure out routines and or you know protocols to make it efficient and, and effective and if we do find something it would be uh, of interest to our, our certainly our stu our students and all uh, yes yeah, it's just, we're always it's kind of for us it's just the it's kind of a fun way to spend our time uh, with things that again maybe could be beneficial we will, a study we finished up a couple years ago is still uh, changing the way we teach it's, it was the strategy of where golfers would, uh, well, the catchphrase always has been aim small to miss small, where you would aim at a very precise target in the distance or on the green. And we, we just tested that. And, and again, it's one of those things where maybe it, it sounds good on paper, but 
it might not be universal, might not be the best way for everybody to do it. What did you find there? No, it's, it's kind of the same idea. That it, as, as the group of golfers were hitting shots and, and going through the routine, it, it wasn't as beneficial as, as it sounds like on paper. Certainly you hear the announcers on TV talk about aiming at a leaf on a tree in the distance or a, a tuff of grass out there 300 yards away or whatever it might be. But again, for the amateur golfer, they, they performed better if they had a little bit of leeway right and left of the of the tent and didn't get as precise to that target. With that, again, I think more the laser precision of, of aiming it perfectly at the, at the target. So, at, at, so uh, instead of trying to be totally perfect to like the certain branch on a tree, more, more of like a strike zone or, a, or, a, or a, a specific zone that you're trying to go to. Yeah, just more leeway right and left. I mean, we gave them, uh, when we tested it with the driver, we gave them the width of the fairway. The goal was still to hit it in the middle of the fairway. Uh-huh. But, it, but they had, a, they had a more room than just the dead center cut of the fairway. And oddly enough, when they were given that little bit of leeway, club head speed increased slightly, ball speed increased, smash factor improved a little bit, and the ball, oddly enough, was a little bit less offline and, and a little bit more distance. So dispersion tightened up and distance increased, and they were aiming more at the fairway as a whole versus that the, the leaf on a tree, like you say, 250 yards away. Right, right. So, uh... You know, again, the anecdotal comments after that, or the comments that they would give us after that, were more... In the, which would make sense that you know, I felt more freedom I didn't feel as restricted I didn't guide the shot as much um, you know, those are some of the comments we heard the whole time right right so the, it seems to be between the putting study and the intermediate target study and then also just like the uh, the detail of focus study it seems like the more the more freedom and kind of natural movement you, you, you allow a golfer to have the better they're doing not a bad thing to be looking at as, a, as an instructor. What, what can you do to minimize restricting your your students' um, range? Of, I'm, not, I'm not too sure how to say it, but yeah, as far as, yeah, just, what can you do to alleviate some of the things that people do in, out on the golf course in the performance environment that just kind of bind them up? And, and certainly aiming at a very precise target 200 yards away or aiming at the pen, the exact point of the pin uh, with an iron into the green, uh, maybe some latitude right and left uh, isn't, isn't as uh, damaging as you think it would be. Uh, when we looked at that aim small, miss small idea, we, we really didn't see any research out there that had been applied to a sport like golf. There, there was a fair amount of research on aiming at a, a very small target when it comes to target shooting or archery. Yeah. But again, that's, you know, that's a different kind of activity so a lot more a lot more movement in a golf swing obviously compared to uh, shooting a, a bow and arrow kind of thing so yeah yeah I mean I, th- I think the way you said that was really good Eric so in, in your uh, how long have you been teaching uh, I have been at Pinehurst for probably 36 years so I've been I, I started teaching when I got here and in your so be better golfers uh, people who watch this channel or, or listen to this are mostly, not all, but mostly golfers who feel like they were getting better at one point and then they plateaued and now like they, they, they're they kind of hunting for something that'll kind of, um, that will help them break into like a, a new level of better golf. For From your experience, what do you see for the plateaued kind of golfer? What do you see as the 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 area that would be like the the richest place to mine golf improvement for them? Well, I tell you, that, that's a really a really great question, and I would say probably from my experience because I do meet a lot of people that are at that stage um, in our golf schools. That I think probably the most common thing that we are talking with them about. Typically, they have a good sense of what's going on in their golf swing and what they need to fix. They just are unable to fix it. Yeah. And so we now are faced not so much with the diagnosis as much as how do we, what medication do we prescribe to fix this reoccurring 
tilt, out, down swing pass, out in, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and it's really trying to give them different ways to think about solving the same issue. So, for example, bear with me just for a second, but if, if you break down swing cues into two categories, basically a swing cue is going to fall into one category or the other. One's called an internal cue, and the other's called an external cue. An internal cue would be where the golfer is thanking himself, turn the shoulder, shift the weight, whatever it might be. An external cue is where they're putting their attention to the club face, the shaft of the club, the ball flight, but basically the focus of attention is externally than on their body. Most of the time that I meet people that have plateaued is where they're too geared towards internal swing cues, where they're trying to do things that will make sense. I mean, they're trying to do, turn more with their shoulders. They're trying to improve their downswing path by getting their tucking their right elbow to their side in the downswing or tilting their shoulders or something. But it's so internalized that they're not able to fix it all the time. And so it tends to be a reoccurring issue where an external cue might just be needed in that case to free them up to do what they're trying to do. So most of, so back to your question, I think most of the time when I see people that are plateaued, it's, it's not really because they diagnosed it incorrectly or they maybe they work with an instructor and it's been misdiagnosed. It's really they're not given enough ways to work on the same thing that might be more how they have to think about it. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I've uh, seen golfers and, and known people that like, they'll be over the top for 20 years and they know it, you know, yeah. they, they know, they know exactly what they're doing, but they're, uh, they just seem kind of like uh, stuck in a, in a, a record player that just keeps looping again and again, you know, like a Groundhog Day kind of syndrome. Yeah, and, and then they have that ownership too, as far as a lot of this. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, they definitely didn't want to fail, for sure, yeah. Right, right. But, like, this is your idea now, so let's see it. Um, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, tell me, tell me, I like to ask this sometimes to the people I have on the channel. Tell me, a, a, like, an anecdote or a story about a golfer in this kind of situation and one of the things that clicked for him or her. Needed to. 
drop their arms to initiate the downswing. Okay. And, and I was watching. We we hit a couple shots, and we and they wanted to see it on video, so I took them into our video bay, and uh, their arms were dropping. But the trouble is, their arms didn't drop quick enough before their upper body started to unwind. So no matter that their arms were dropping like they should have been, the, the shaft was still too steep and well above plane coming down. And so then they said, oh, yeah, the guy, the guy told me to keep my back to the target. And we tried to videotape that a couple times, and, you know, it was maybe a little better, but still pretty steep. Yeah. The downswing. And then I just introduced the idea of two shafts on the ground, a target line shaft and then a shaft at about a 20-degree angle to the right. And I said, just try to swing the club head on that. In this case, it was an orange shaft. The yellow shaft was the target line. Just try to swing the club head on that orange line through impact. So your club head's going to be parallel to that line. And we filmed that, and that was better. And we've actually, the downstream path changed quite rapidly because it, it was just, again, an external cue that was just easier for this individual to do. And they turned to me and said, hey, after hitting a few shots, he said, this is what I always thought of as a kid. I tried to think in terms of swinging over to the first baseman. And that's what, and I said, well, what kind of shots did you hit? He said, well, I, I hit a lot more draws, and I kind of played low draw shots as a kid, and this, this is exactly what I remember doing. And it was kind of an aha moment for them because they realized at that point that, you know, maybe they, they probably did it too much as a kid. You don't want to swing too much out to the right, but, uh, you know, that's certainly a little bit more productive than an over-the-top move swinging towards third baseman. So yeah. I guess that would be just something recently that happened where the external cue wasn't the one that I offered, wasn't the one we used in the end, but it did spark that recollection of, oh, that's why that always worked kind of thing, which was an aha moment for me as well as there. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting because... So he, he had a, a good idea, it just, it wasn't nearly as extreme as he, he needed to feel it, and he was never really going to feel it until he got this external cue. Exactly. And now, at the same time, I would, I would challenge an instructor that, you know, taking a, somebody that, even if they're a skilled golfer, to have them hit shots where they keep their back to the target and their arms drop significantly before everything else moves, Yeah. that's pretty hard to do. Yeah, you. Be, I mean, that's just kind of challenging for my uh, just an athletic movement. So, kind of back to your thing, your comment earlier is that you try to figure out ways to to make the motion more athletic, where the person doesn't have to think as much about it. Right, right. And again, whatever cue they come up with. In this case, the guy disregarded the idea of swinging the club head on that orange line through impact. He just went back to the idea of swinging towards first base, which they're the same thing. It's just how he preferred to think of it. But again, it was, it yeah. was like you said, just, it, it, he knew what he wanted to do. He just wasn't doing it in a way that allowed him to do it. He wasn't thinking about it the right way for him. Yeah, that's great. Well, th thanks a lot, Eric, for, for all your time and, and, uh, and the work and everything. Well, no problem. I appreciate the opportunity. hope you guys have a great day. How can, pe how can people get in contact with you or if they want to come to one of your schools or things like that? Oh, sure. Well, we have a, obviously, Pioneer has a website, so just look up pinehurst.com and the golf academy and and as well as contact information for me is all right there on the website and uh, we have you know, a little bit of a description of the golf academy and the schools that we offer and you're more than welcome to take a look at that and if you have any questions just uh, give us a call on the number that's uh, on that page and we'll be happy to answer those questions for you thanks a lot okay guys okay, thanks for thank you thanks for watching everybody uh click the subscribe button it really helps the channel see you later bye